On the north side of Chicago, sandwiched just east of Wrigley Field and west of Lake Michigan, is Boys Town. Established in the late 1960s as the nation's first official gay neighborhood, it was one of the only safe spaces for LGBTQ people to openly live their lives in the entire city. It has become one of the city's most well-known areas and, after finishing high school and moving to Chicago, was a place I called home for nearly a decade. Seemingly overnight, rent prices have skyrocketed, resulting in many people in the area to be pushed out. Gay bars have begun to close and are being replaced by trendier, more mainstream restaurants that cater to both straight and gay patrons. Programs for LGBT homeless people have vanished that used to dot the streets. And the future of one of the world's most famous areas and neighborhoods finds itself wondering, is the gayborhood even needed anymore? And if so, by who? I'm Zach Stafford, the editor-in-chief of Into, an LGBTQ digital magazine. And during my last month before moving away from the city I pretty much grew up in, I spent days talking with the activists and restaurateurs about how the food and drink industry control the landscape of the neighborhood and are now changing it for better or for worse, depending on who you ask. Over the years, Fury Spoon made its mark in many up-and-coming areas around Chicago, such as Wicker Park, Logan Square, Pilsen, and now in Boystown. This is co-owner Chef Shin Thompson. Before sitting down to chat with me about his fast-growing franchise, he invited me on a tour of his latest venture in the heart of Boystown. Their new location will be in the place of Spin, an iconic gay club that was sold in 2014, a former space I grew up in as an underage kid wanting to see drag queens and meet other people like me, and maybe find a boyfriend if I was lucky. Now the space will serve food trends that have popularized in the wider market. Boys Town Strip is like so much about nightlife too. So a lot of the restaurants are doing like food from all day till about 10 and then they become like a more like clubby type scene. Yeah. Do you see that happening here? I don't know about clubby scene, but we'll definitely be open late, so. Did you play hip hop music? We play hip hop music, yes. Um, I don't know if there's gonna be much room to dance around here or anything like that, but uh, it, it should be lively. Yeah, there used to be a pool table right here and people would play pool and like, what was great about it is you would play pool, people could see you outside. That's what people came in, so they saw something they thought was attractive, they would like run through the door and come in here. Oh, this is the original graffiti. Yeah, we're yeah. Gonna, I think we're gonna keep this. Yeah, this is awesome. I don't know who did this, but I remember, like this used to not be very well lit, and you would have no idea what was on the wall. But if you look at our other shops, we're very, we have it like, yeah, a lot yeah. of graffiti. It's on, it's on brand, you're saying on brand. <laughs> this is where the bathrooms were. Um, it's interestingly going to become the prep kitchen. Really? <laughs> Don't worry, we're taking down all the walls, restripping everything, all the plumbing, electric, all brand new, so. I hope you're using a lot of bleach, because a lot of- It'll be good as new. Yeah, like beyond it being a bathroom, this is like, we're like, I'm not going to say what happened down there, but <laughs> things happened in this bathroom. Um, not in my life, you know, other people's lives, but it was a really popular bathroom. Um, so that was weird. Like a lot of gay men or LGBT people will go there, sure, but it's mostly gonna be a restaurant that a lot of the straight people go to in the neighborhood as the neighborhood becomes more straight. Uh, so it's gonna be weird the day that I do go there and see people eating ramen next to those windows or walking down those stairs with the graffiti and they thinking it's, them thinking it's like just part of the decor and not realizing it's part of this really long history in Boys Town. Uh, that's really important to a lot of us. This is a really good example of the responsibility of going into cultural neighborhoods, whether it's a gay neighborhood or a Latino neighborhood, and understanding what you're erasing when you go into that space and how that may mean a lot to other people and you're not realizing and how much, how hurtful that could be. Due to decades of discrimination, gay bars have typically been the only place an LGBTQ person could go and openly be themselves. And some of the most important people I've met in Boys Town during my time living there weren't on the dance floor, but slinging drinks. These folks were the ones to go to for any hot gossip, to get advice, or just hear about what was happening in the hood. This is Hadith Safi, a bartender and HIV awareness advocate who works at Replay. I think there are places that will always be a gay refuge, right? I think there are places that we will always continue to make our own because we have to. We have to, and no matter who comes in, and tries to kind of make it theirs, we just gotta push back. We have two restrooms here, and a woman walked 
one of my customers actually, I walked out of the quote unquote women's restroom, it's a private restroom, but it has like Miss Pac-Man on it. And she goes, y why were you in the girls' restroom? I was like, why are you gendering a bathroom and a gay bar? Stop it. <laughs> like this is all just the bathroom girl. It's just a bathroom. <laughs> So historically, people like you have been pillars of the community, and that's what people came to gay bars, is to have that person that not only served them the drink, but got them access to services, which you do yeah. in your own yeah. life. Do you still think that role is really vital to this neighborhood? Do you think all the bartenders should also kind of exemplify what you do? I think all the bartenders do exemplify that in a sense, right? So like, you have people like me, and there are multiple people who work in the industry on the Strip, who work in like HIV and AIDS-related services or social work. Um, but there are also people who work and they don't do that kind of direct work, but they do social work in the sense that they create spaces outside of bars and they work with spaces outside of bars for queer, for predominantly gay men, honestly, to, to, to meet and to, to feel safe. It's like, oh, well, there's this, there's this party, there's this event, there's this museum, there's this um, awesome cult like, cultural aspect of the city that you may not know because you're new here, so let me help you. And I really try to remember like all the different intersectionality and the different the different parts of who we all are, right? It's not just one person that has one thing and there's so much that makes us. Because there's so much that makes me and there's so much that makes you. And I gotta remember all of those things I'm trying to be there for people. And also make a good Manhattan. Uh, yes, ma'am. <laughs> Ginny Veloces is a Filipina trans woman who recently opened up her own bakery on the edge of Boys Town and Wrigley Field, which is interesting as the juxtaposition of the stadium to the neighborhood has led to homophobic abuse in the past. But her bakery signifies how those in the hospitality industry can provide not just goods and services, but hope, refuge, and positivity. Actually finding this location is like the perfect spot because originally I wanted to open a bakery in the heart of Boys Town. I felt like Chicago um, needed a bakery that the LGBT community can call their own. As it turns out, this spot is perfect because it's not necessarily in the heart of Boys Town, but it's close enough where like people from all walks of life can come in and experience an atmosphere of just feeling welcome, regardless of where you come from and what your background is. and enjoy dessert. Yeah. When I'm in the kitchen and I'm creating and I'm baking, it's my ultimate escape. I get to for, I, I get to be in this world where I'm just focused on creating and I'm not thinking about like my 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 problems or my daily struggles. I I'm just focused on creating beautiful things and things that taste good and I think everybody needs some kind of creative outlet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Opening a bakery is not just about baking, you know, it's you have to wear many hats. You have yeah. to think about you know the business side of it. All these things that I have no experience of, it's, it's very, very challenging. Luckily, I've had amazing friends and people that are helping me. Does your mom come to the bakery? Yeah, she does. She helps me out a lot. She's like my business advisor. She helps you know in the front of the house, and she gives me a lot of great advice. Well, she was the first one that was very concerned about me opening a shop, but like once she saw the outpour of support, she was like, oh my god. You know, she was she was just as surprised as I was. She got it. Yeah. Do you feel like you've made your mother proud? Um, I hope that, you know, through this bakery, she can see that this is what truly makes me happy and fulfilled as a, as um, being the person that I am, being trans. Um, this is a place where I feel like I can make an impact on people's lives. Your gift is your birthday, 21. I don't like you. Just because you're young, but I still like you. It's fine, it's fine. Happy birthday, my love. Thank you for coming here. As Boys Town has become an entertainment destination, some businesses have begun capitalizing off this trend, especially when it comes to bachelorette parties. Heritage commodification, or the process of selling one's culture for a tourist gaze in order to make money, is lucrative for business owners now with the mainstreaming of LGBTQ politics, but it's also controversial. Here in Boys Town, Kit Kat Lounge, a popular dining and entertainment venue with its drag performances by trans women like Dulce Andrews, and its huge selection of martini cocktails is the clearest example of this type of commodification. Prior to marriage equality, there were bars that were banning bachelorette parties due to LGBTQ people not having equal rights. 
but Kit Kat was one of the few places that kept its doors open to straight women. While the historic inclusiveness is admirable, it was perhaps necessary for its survival as a gay-owned establishment. Well, Boys Town has always been a destination spot. So hopefully, as time goes by, making the neighborhood look and feel more gay is gonna make even more people come from you know, other communities to come celebrate life and celebrate being gay. What makes this place so special is that all of these restaurants and bars are next to each other, but I'm sure that has to get tenuous at times. I mean, you all are, are a community, but you're also a competition. So what has that been like for you all? Well, you know, I, I don't want to call it competition, but you know, we all try to work together as a community in the neighborhood. We want to bring more people to the neighborhood. And if we all offer you know, top quality cuisine and we all offer something different, it's only going to benefit the street and make more people come here. As places like Kit Kat Lounge profit from the straight consumption of gay culture, other gay-owned restaurants want to open the neighborhood up to being a dining destination as well. For a strip that is used to low price and low quality food, Wood did something different. Recognized by Michelin Guides as offering excellent food for five years straight, Wood began paving the way for more upscale dining experiences in the area. What made you finally decide to come here? There just wasn't anything in this neighborhood. And so I just felt that it was time that this neighborhood started making its mark on the culinary world, just like the West Loop does, or Logan Square, for example, just has become a mecca of restaurants. Yeah. So this is why we decided this neighborhood, it needed a restaurant of this caliber. Talk to me about the price points. You all, I remember being one of the first restaurants beyond Yoshi's that kind of had a little more of a higher price point. And I remember people being a little nervous about that. Yes, How did you were. feel about that as you kind of said, you know what, we're going to do small plates starting at 12 and large plates starting at 24. Like that was a first for this block especially. You're right. We felt that, you know what, a dollar more here, two dollar more here people will recognize that in the quality of the food. And for the first couple months, we had some pushback by the neighborhood, but we don't hear anything about it anymore. What is your advice to straight men or straight people who are coming to the neighborhood to open up their own restaurants? Anyone and everyone should be allowed through your doors. They're your guests, they're your clients, and they're gonna keep your business going. And this neighborhood isn't going to change. We're going to stay who we are, we're going, our businesses are always going to be LGBT community friendly, and whether you're straight or gay, people are going to frequent your restaurant. Franco's openness to welcome new businesses made me think of Furious Spoon and how perhaps it contributes to the homogenization of gay culture that's been happening in recent years. So what's the response been like around the city to have your ramen shops opening up in neighborhoods where ramen wasn't necessarily thought to be? And has there been any pushback from the locals? We try and go into neighborhoods that we think that we'll really enjoy what we bring, um, the food, the environment. We try and kind of handpick those neighborhoods. Our latest shop opened just in Pilsen. Uh, that's kind of a, another up and coming neighborhood, which is like Logan Square like five years ago. I think once we kind of engaged with the community, um, explained to them, you know, I don't think we're pricing anybody out of the neighborhood. You know, you can get a bowl of ramen for $8. How do you see yourself kind of uh, being a part of a community that's been long standing? Um, well, we definitely want to be integrated in the community um, where people are feel welcomed and we're felt welcomed back. How do we do that? I think providing a good product and good service and just being open to people's concerns in the neighborhood, you know. You want to hear something funny? You remember yeah. the bathrooms down there that the manhole used to be connected to? Absolutely. Guess what they're now? I did a walk through. Guess what they're becoming? What are they now? The prep kitchens. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the stories those walls could tell. <laughs> like any community, Boys Town has had its own problems with inclusion of different intersectionalities, especially with regards to race, gender, and other social issues. My friend Kylan, a social worker who works with LGBTQ youth experiencing homelessness, has been a vocal person in the community working against this exclusion. As youth is understood under the age of 24, um, there are a lot of spaces now that won't cater to young folks yeah. because of the perception. Um, and as this neighborhood continues to grow and change, black and brown young folks continue to be more and more silenced and unheard. But why haven't these businesses wanted to embrace young people at all? 
I, I think there's a lot of misconception. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of misunderstanding. Uh, there's definitely a lot of assumption being made, again, about someone's access mm -hmm. um, to contribute, right? So financially, sure, and we're entering the district now, right, the entertainment district. Yeah. Will these young people be able to spend money in my establishment? Yeah. And it's a place you dream of moving when you're a young gay kid in the country, because you're like, I'm going to live in Boys Town one day, and then you get here, and they realize, like, they don't want you here. <laughs> they want something else here. But what I heard about this parking lot is that a few years ago, as you've been talking about young people and how the neighborhood has not been really loving on them, there was a moment of called Take Back Boys Town. Uh -huh. What was that about? Who were they taking it back from? Because this place has been so gay forever. I think that was the perpetual question, right? More people are moving in and buying property, and so they're setting down roots and they're staying, and those people, for the most part, are middle to upper class white folks, right? And so this movement started when these folks started noticing the black and brown trans queer youth walking up and down Halstead Street that there was this sentiment that they felt unsafe mm -hmm. for just being in the neighborhood and sharing the neighborhood with these kids, mm -hmm. right? And so a movement started called Take Back Boys Town and it started in this parking lot, yeah. was the big rally. And was there a stabbing here what happened? Or what was like the uh, ignition point? There was, I think, I think it was during a pride mm -hmm. and there was an altercation. One of the things that happens when young people have resources that are taken away from them and shut down, mm -hmm. right, is this rubbing of personalities, mm -hmm. right? This. Uh, this sort of lack of community building, the opposite of community building, which has people feeling threatened. Yeah. And I think, so there was a moment that that happened and there was some violence that happened in this community. And so that was the impetus, I think, for this group that was Take Back Boys Town. We see the fear rising mm -hmm. and the lack of community engagement, mm -hmm. right? We didn't necessarily have to take back Boys Town. We could have engaged Boys Town in conversation. Yeah. And so, we know that as these things change, there are specific identities that just aren't welcome in the neighborhood anymore. Yeah. So what do you think the future of the neighborhood is? Who is it for? Who is this neighborhood for now? And who are they building all this for? So I don't even know that the future of this neighborhood will stay gay and queer, which is a shame when we think about the obelisks, right? That all these rainbows <laughs> that are dotting this area. Right? That they erected in order to anchor community. Right. But do you think it's always going to be that elite community that will stay here? Because I've talked to a lot of bar owners and they say, you know, this will always be gay. And I think when they say that, they're saying like, our restaurant will always be here. And it feels like a certain type of people, like people that go to these galas, uh, will always have this neighborhood for them. Yeah, I think that's exactly what we're talking about. I think as, as we're talking about um, it not necessarily staying gay, we're also talking about it not st staying affordable. We're also talking about like certain classes that are invited, right? So as we talk about not only what is middle and upper class white folks, we're also talking about the elite gay community mm -hmm. who can't afford to buy here. Mm -hmm. And it's so sad to see that change. Cause you know, it's so funny when you come to Boys Town, especially as a young person and you see the fantasy start to dissolve, that it is a business. Like there are, this is about money. This is about like having profit. Then you're kind of like, oh, well, is it? I thought it was just going to be magical and it's going to be like Disneyland for me. But then you realize Disneyland is really expensive, <laughs> and it takes a lot of money to keep it going. Right. And you got to like clean these pylons. You got to keep these places open. You've got to be able to afford Disneyland, mm -hmm. right? If not, I'm not going. Yep. Right. I might be at Six Flags. <laughs> right. I might be somewhere different. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we will see this neighborhood change, and probably not in the way that community initially envisioned it. Mm -hmm. Probably not in that way. And that is sad to see. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. This is the Human First Gala, thrown by the Center on Halstead, the hub that provides social, health, and education resources for the LGBTQ community in Chicago. This center came about as a result of years of lobbying and huge donations from the political figures and businessmen and women of Chicago. And nights like these sit uncomfortably with the reality that the LGBTQ community is divided into two far removed groups. The ones prosperous and affluent enough to attend galas and donate large sums of money, and the ones that rely on the center but cannot afford to live near it. I'm at the center today, and ironically during my visit, an event exploring the question who does the neighborhood belong to is occurring, where residents have been invited to hear from experts on what is actually happening to the place they live. Jason Orn is a sociologist who's written a book on the matter. Today, I feel like more of the, gay, the bar owners, particularly the gay ones, really are invested in creating a community. What's interesting is that a lot of them have specifically chosen to own gay bars to 
create gay space because they think that those kinds of spaces are important. Uh, which is why then you see like an interesting tension today with the heritage commodification that's going on because they really want to save the area as a gay area even as they're bringing in tourists to actually buy the goods and services that are around. Do you think straight people coming to our places, our spaces, are they making them de-gay or are we making them gay? As they come in, it's still gay, as in like the identity and parts of the culture, but it's desexualized. So it's often not having a lot of the uh, really more radical and sort of sexuality that used to be in those spaces. And are we losing some of our gay culture, some of the raunchiness and some of the over-the-topness mm -hmm. that maybe is less acceptable. Yeah. Like, the gay, like the kids on the street. You know, you're allowed to be gay as long as you're, you know, an upper-class white uh, married couple, mm -hmm. you know, who wants to go to brunch yeah. and fits a sort of stereotypical view of a gay guy. So what does the future look like for Boys Town? Because as you've presented, the past and some of the present is meant to be a space of refuge, of community, mm -hmm. but it seems like that commercialization, the Disneyland effect, yeah. is taking over. So what do you see happening here in the next few years? Do you think these young kids are going to never come back here anymore and then the place comes no longer Disneyland? Well, I guess it was never Disneyland for them. <laughs> yeah, it was never Disneyland for them. Um, I hope that they continue to, uh, you know, resist and that hopefully, you know, uh, as we get people in positions like here at the Center on Halstead that are supporting those people um, and supporting, um, you know, helping uh, them not in a way that's trying to change them and their culture, but rather embracing it. Like, I, I hope they could continue to flourish, but I think we're seeing also multiple other gay areas form here in Chicago. Sort of the sanitized, touristy, gay Disneyland and the more radical, the more inclusive, but also the more scary to straight society, uh, those kinds of bars and communities opening up in other parts. For the business owners led by straight people who are coming to the area in hopes of profiting from the mainstreaming of it, the future of Boys Town seems paved with gold. As the neighborhood sees its rent prices grow and more condos erect, this trend doesn't look to be slowing down. But for the businesses and people wanting to keep the neighborhood as a refuge for queer people, the future is pretty gray. Sure, some spaces are flourishing with the new influx of businesses, but many other spaces and services are disappearing. Thankfully, the spirit of grassroots activism that first established the neighborhood is still pushing through the cracks, serving as a reminder that Boys Town isn't just a neighborhood, but a safe space for so many people. While I know that the area may never be what it once was, or maybe even what people always hoped it to be, I do know that people like me will find a home for ourselves with all of our glitter and all of our glamour somewhere in the city, Boys Town or not and the bars and restaurants will most likely follow.